I don't know if you were here last week, but if you were, then maybe you got to hear Rick and Christina, right? They were awesome, weren't they? And they have spent quite a bit of time now in Korea, and having spent that much time, they're doing what, well, any person would do when they are in a new place. They're making friends, real friends, and they're sharing what's really important about their lives, and what's really important to Rick and Christina is Jesus, right? Okay. Well, I don't know about you, but when I was hearing them tell the story in their presentation, I was back, you know, looking like I was messing with the sound, but got myself a little teary-eyed, a little case of the eye sweats as, um, as I listened to them talking about their friends, you know, uh, Sowerdeep and Avishikta and Shaggy and, and how these people, they're, they're now following Jesus too. They're praying to him. And, and they're trusting in him. They're going in his way of love and truth. And, and I was just praising and praying and thanking God that now there's going to be, oh, there's going to be more people who, who will be with us for all eternity because they now trust in the one who was slain but is now living, the one who has purchased for God with his blood people, persons, from all different tribes and languages, peoples and nations. Because they have become friends, now there are those even this very day, on this Lord's Day of Worship, who have joined in our voice in praising Him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be all glory, honor, praise and power and dominion forever and ever. Amen. When you meet Jesus, really meet Jesus, not the Jesus as seen on TV, not the Jesus on the internet, not the Jesus uh, uh, presented by his most fringe and crazy elements of the Christian faith, and certainly not those, the haters in his name, and not those that are just Christians in name only, but when you really meet Jesus, encounter him, hear his voice, experience him. There is a change in your life. There is a conversion from the old way to this new way of life with Jesus, all as a gift of the Holy Spirit's working. And this is for now all people, without exceptions, every tribe and language and people. Now, that's a pretty big claim. You better have some evidence and some proof to back up such a big claim, or you're just like every other advertiser, showing big but giving small. The evidence and the proof is right here in Acts chapter 9, where we, we are introduced to um, a radicalized religious extremist who was terrorizing the Middle East, a man by the name of Paul, Saul of Tarsus. He uh, described himself as, well, circumcised on the eighth day uh, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. Uh-huh, Hebrew of Hebrews. Oh, when it comes to the law, Pharisee. Uh, as for zeal, huh, persecuting Christians, love that. As for uh, righteousness according to the law, wait for it, wait, faultless. Oh yeah, you could not find a more Jewish Jew than this man, pious in practice, dangerous in the defense of his Jewish faith. A most unlikely candidate and yet was the very instrument that God had chosen to bring the Christian faith to much of the Gentile world. This Saul of Tarsus would write 13 of the 27 books of the New Testament. Not quite half, but that's something. And, and how you and I think about God, 
What we believe about his righteousness and forgiveness has largely been formed by this useful instrument of Saul of Tarsus, who was on his way to Damascus to imprison and kill Christians. Until, right, he encountered Jesus. Boom, he's on the ground. Now, I don't think Jesus pushed him, okay? I don't think Jesus is mean like that. And it's like bully in town, you know. I, I think it was just a demonstration because your body helps your mind realize what's going on. You see, this was completely uh, out of his radar world. See, Jesus was a fable. He, his resurrection from the dead, it's a myth, people. It's made up. And this just drove him insane. He, he went from house to house, from city now to city, to stamp out the liars who are pro propelling this lie on to more and more people. Of course, he was wrong. You know, I mean, the, the, the myth of Jesus, the fable of his resurrection from the dead was proved conclusively as to be true, authenticated by the one who died and is now alive, standing in front of him saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I am Jesus whom you persecute. Yeah, Paul, Saul was a pretty, and the reason I keep calling him Paul, because that's his name too. Okay, but Saul, he was a pretty extreme kind of guy, and his conversion was an extreme event. And, and having, having encountered Jesus, now is blind, miraculously seeing again after three days, receiving the Holy Spirit, being baptized into Jesus, he doesn't just sit around in a pew. Oh, no. He's, boom, back into the synagogues to tell everybody Jesus is the Son of God. He spent three years in that area of Arabia where Damascus is, convincing and arguing and debating with his fellow Jews that Jesus is, and proving it, the Messiah. Oh, yeah. When you meet Jesus, when you encounter him, when you hear him, experience him, there is a life change. There is a conversion from an old way of life to a brand new way of life as a gift of the Holy Spirit, and it is conclusive. It is available to all people without exceptions or exclusions. So, how is this working today? You know, you, you really don't hear in the paper about Jesus pushing people down anymore and, and, and blinding them and then sending them out into the mission field. You, you just don't see it. So how is Jesus encountering people? Well, if you listen carefully to the conversation Jesus had with Saul, it was all in there. Do you remember what he said? He said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Jesus so identifies with those who follow in his way that to hurt them is to hurt me. To abuse them is to abuse me. Now, we know that Saul and Jesus never saw each other before this moment. Uh, and yet, Jesus, as he sees things, you're abusing me. So when you turn that around, his followers represent him in the world. You are the encounter of Jesus for the world. That's at least how Jesus sees it. So think about that. If you're a Christian in name only, if you're a, a hater in his name, or you're proposing some kind of strange out there doctrine, you're presenting a very different kind of Jesus, right? But you, who follow in his way, his way is love and truth, not one or the other, both full on, without exceptions. Love and truth. You represent, you are Jesus in the world. When people encounter you, they encounter him. So, 
keeping in mind there's also a certain sense of timeliness to this. You can't just go knocking on doors, talking to people and saying, boom, you just had your Jesus encounter. There you go. No, it, it doesn't work like that. It, and we are at least allowed to, to see the, this Ananias situation where, you know, Saul is ready, Ananias. I've prepared him. Now you go. The, people have to be ready. And, and I'm really glad that we are allowed to hear the conversation because it's a lot like me, you know, maybe, maybe the rest of us. You know, God, right, comes to Ananias and says, hey, go to Saul and, and heal him and send him. And what does Ananias say? Oh, I'm not feeling it. It's, it's just scary. He's mean. He might hurt me. I, uh, you know, and what? This is Jesus. He's sending you. And it's like, ah, uh, yeah. Uh, who doesn't feel like that quite often? Okay, <laughs> all right. Yeah, and, and, and Jesus, you know, okay, we're going. And okay, I'll take care of you. And so there's a timeliness to it. What are we waiting, and what do we do while we're waiting for Jesus to get people ready and, and, and for him to give us courage to go and, and talk to people? What? Well, we learned that from Rick and Christina, right? We, we learned from a lot of other people. But while you're waiting for Jesus to get people ready to him, encounter him through you, we're making friends, real friends, not polite acquaintances. Friends in which you're sharing what's really important to you, and, and, and that would be Jesus. I mean, if you're living and working with people and they don't know you're a Christian, you have committed friendship malpractice right? Because that's what friends do. They share the stuff that's really important. And, and if, of course, if you're a Christian in name only, you know, then, of course, that wouldn't happen. And, and if you're a hater in his name, you know, people are like, whoa, that's good. Or if you're some kind of fringe Christian, it's like, wow, that is really a strange doctrine. But you're not. You know him. You know his blood has purchased you for God. You know you will sit around the throne one day praising the Lamb and Him who sits there forever and ever. You're not fringe. You're not a hater. You're the beloved. Now, as you then are waiting for Jesus to get people ready, you're making friends in two groups. This isn't hard. You don't have to write it down. Two groups. Those who are in and those who are out. Those who are in the congregation and those who are outside. Did you know, did you know that 80% of our youth who are in this congregation, when they have a chance to not come here because you aren't forcing them to come, 80% of them will not come back? Did you know that the new people who join this congregation, half of them leave the congregation within a year because they've not made a friend? It takes five friends for a new person to feel connected to a congregation five friends so what are we doing while we're waiting for jesus we're making friends real friends friends who you're sharing what's really important not just polite acquaintances but it's not just in but it's also out you have a lot of acquaintances a lot of friends on the out now it's scary. I know we're all Ananias. Like, I don't want to. <laughs> and Jesus is with us saying, go. Okay, I'm with you. I love you. I'm empowering you to do this to help you this coming week. Let's spend time with two groups of people, with Jesus and with friends. And so I, I have this card on the, the table as you're leaving. Pick one up. You're going to spend time with Jesus this week, Monday through Friday. There's a little Bible passage Read it, dwell on it, think about it, allow Jesus to speak. Does he speak? Yeah, through his word. Allow him to speak, talk to him. And then time with friends. I have a space here for you to write down some friends' names in which you and Jesus are going to be friends with. Now, this, these are people maybe you're already friends. Maybe it's youth in the congregation. Maybe it's somebody that's sitting here like, we worship here forever, I don't know your name. So let's start a friendship, you know. Yeah, I know it's hard, but guess who rose from the dead and has power? 
Jesus, guess who really loves you? Jesus, guess who's going to help you make friends? Jesus. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, thank you. I pray that you would give us all a case of the eye sweats to realize who we are in you and what you're doing in this congregation and outside of it to draw people from every nation to you. Give us a heart of love and joy in you. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please stand. We confess our faith to one another with the words of the Nicene Creed saying, I